All right, hello everybody. This is uh, Antonio Wolf, and uh, after quite a uh, not so long a break, I suppose. I mean, just like what was it about a month and a half, Maybe about a month, three weeks, almost two months. We finally started, uh, got the courage to uh, get back on uh, the science of logic and uh, continue on at least power through to the end of chapter three. Um, in my very, very slow and uh, <laughs> kind of forced uh, attempt to uh, redo my outlines of chapter two, and I'm kind of like about two-thirds finished, when I got to limit, I realized uh, I sort of misunderstood limit uh, in the way that I did like in, in the last talks, but I'm not going to go over that right now because I still haven't like fully worked that out. I just know there's a bit of a mistake I kind of made in, in interpreting it. But, I mean, it's not really much of a dire mistake. But uh, um, I'll correct that once uh, I fully get it worked out. And just uh, something interesting to point out. It seems that limit is kind of like uh, determinate determinateness in a way. In which you know, rather than talking about some vague determinate determinateness, like a a concrete determinateness is a limit, which is neat. It's a it's a very interesting yep. thing. It makes sense when you think about it. Just in common, like thinking. Isn't that the case with all of Hegel? It makes sense when you really think about it. It's actually <laughs> so close to common thinking. It's kind of like, how did we not understand? How did, how did we not? How did we not already know this? Yeah, it's just like verifying what we already knew, but we didn't realize that we knew. It's just That's common great. sense, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Hegel. It's just common sense. So why bother reading it, right? Yeah, just no, go no, along really. with <laughs> your head already. <laughs> no. But all right, we chapter all three, uh, being for itself, an important chapter, and the reason why I wanted to meet, make it at least to the end of this chapter is this kind of closes off uh, something I said like in the last chapter at the end, uh, that uh, this chapter should be the kind of closing off of the first version of something like the concept that is way, way in the last book of The Science of Logic. But it definitely brings before uh, quite a few questions which can be uh, better formulated in more advanced categories, but which allow you, give you a key to formulate uh, a lot of interesting relationships with it nonetheless. Uh, without further ado, um, let's get to it being for itself in being for itself qualitative being is brought to completion it is infinite being the being of the beginning is void of determination existence is sublated but only immediately sublated being it thus contains to begin with only the first negation itself immediate being is of course retained as well and the two are united in existence in simple unity for this reason, however, each is in itself still unlike the other, and their unity is still not posited. Existence is, therefore, the sphere of differentiation, of dualism, the domain of finitude. Determinateness is determinateness as such, being which is relatively not absolutely determined. In being for itself, the distinction between being and determinateness, or negation, is posited and equalized, Quality, otherness, limit, as well as reality, in itselfness, ought, and so forth, are the incomplete configurations of negation and being, which are still based on the differentiation of the two. But since infinitude negation has passed over into infinity, in the posited negation of negation, negation is simple self-reference, and in it, therefore, the equalization with being. Absolutely determinate being. So there's stuff there that I, I will admit I do not understand fully. Uh, the stuff about positing, 
I have a very vague notion of it in which positing is something that is explicitly done by the concept as like positing its uh, parts for example you know uh, one could say Ross. that infinity that true infinity posits finitude at its own determinate form and so being well, for you itself use posit to, to explain the definition of posit it's like a postulate it it puts it forward yeah that you know it explicitly like proposes it yeah brings it about uh, rather than, it uh, it doesn't yeah. just happen basically Useful way of putting it is something like making it explicit. So in positing the presupposition, what you're doing is you're bringing the presupposition into relief. Yeah, in that like the concept does it uh, explicitly. That would be probably the best way to put it because in, in so far up to now, the differentiations have just kind of happened. You know, existence happened to become determinate being, determinate being happened to become quality, quality happened to have the dualities of reality and negation. This happened to just, you know, set up the conditions of uh, something and other, something and other happened to set up the conditions of, you know, in itself, of being for itself, being in itself and being for other, that set up the conditions of determinate, uh, of determinateness, well, not determinateness, uh, determination and constitution. Those set up the condition of just it happened to generate the structures of limitation. Limitation just happened to generate the structures of finitude, etc. Whereas with positing, uh, it won't just happen. It will be something that's kind of it's explicitly done by the concept. It has to be asserted. So I think um, maybe something that would be helpful, and uh, like I mentioned before, so I'm reading The Science of Logic right now. I'm not up to chapter three yet, um, but I've also covered this stuff previously in the Encyclopedia Logic, the shorter one. Um, but I think what's going on in this chapter is Hegel is sort of uh, setting up the foundations for the discussion of infinity that's going to happen later in the book. Um, you know, so the kind of determination that occurs through limits that you were talking about, that's true of finite things that can posit a limit for itself. But for infinite things, they're not determined through external uh, negation or some sort of limit, uh, but instead are legitimately self-determining and infinite. And I think that that's sort of what Hegel intends to get at in this kind of chapter. There will also be sort of a discussion of a positive or proper, properly understood in, in infinites later in the book. Yeah, this is a foreshadowing on a lot of things. Like the whole thing about the structure of positing, for example, seems to come uh, uh, most strongly uh, as I've read in. Um, general overviews is, is this comes in fully in uh, the logic of essence and uh, other places but uh, uh, Hegel usually isn't too bad with like just leaving you hanging so you know he tends to explain things uh, more or less. yeah he's not a mystic thankfully hey yeah so continuing First, being for itself is immediately an existent for itself, the one. Second, the one passes over into a multiplicity of ones, repulsion or the otherness and the one which sublates itself into its ideality, attraction. Third, we have the alternating determination of repulsion and attraction in which the two sink into a state of equilibrium. And quality, driven to a head in being for itself, passes over into quantity. So just a little uh, anticipatory summary. Uh, section A, being for itself as such. The general concept of being for itself has come to light. The justification for using the expression being for itself 
for that concept would depend on showing that the representation associated with the expression corresponds to the concept. So indeed it, so indeed it appears to do. We say that something is for itself inasmuch as it sublates otherness, sublates its connection and community with other, has rejected them by abstracting from them. The other is in the other is in it only as something sublated, as its moment. Being for itself consists in having thus transcended limitation, its otherness. It consists in being as this negation, the infinite turning back into itself. In representing to itself an intended object which it feels or intuits and so forth, consciousness already contains in itself as consciousness the determination of being for itself. That is, it has in it the content of that object, which is thus an idealization, even as it intuits or in general becomes involved in the negative of itself. In the other, it abides with itself. Being for itself is the polemical negative relating to the limiting other and, through this negation of the other, is being reflected within itself, even though, side by side, with this imminent turning back of consciousness in the ideality of its object, the reality of this object is also retained, for the object is, at the same time, known as an external existence. Consciousness is thus phenomenal, or it is this dualism. On the, other, on the one side, it knows an external object which is other than it. On the other side, it is for itself, has this intended object in it as idealized, abides not only by this other, but therein abides also with itself. Self-consciousness, on the contrary, is being for itself brought to completion and posited. The side of reference to another, to an external object, is removed. Self-consciousness self is thus the nearest example of the presence of infinity, granted of a still abstract infinity, but one which is of a totally different concrete determination than the being for itself in general, whose infinity still has only qualitative determinedness. So just a little bit of a, the explanation he gives about why well, call it being for itself, right? Uh, then he says, well, obviously, it makes sense. You know, with infinity, we get the structure of something which is no longer outside of itself. You know, it seems to be fully self-contained, so he ejects all otherness as absolute. You know, if there is other in, otherness, it is otherness within it. You know, it is its own otherness, so it's not an alien otherness. So, you know, um, just kind of to give a bit of a refresher on, like, stuff from Chapter 2 when he says, like, at the beginning of the paragraph, I think it's the second sentence, we say that something is for itself in as much as it sublates otherness, sublates its connection and community with other, has rejected them by abstracting from them. You know, and uh, this is, like, uh, how determination works, in which a determination is being in itself, but it's being in itself, which recognizes its dependency on the other as one of the conditions for its being in itself. So, you know, the other is not truly other, it is still constitutive of me and really is me in some sense. But, you know, uh, it posits itself as uh, the true being, and so, you know, the other is only... The other, if it is the other, is not something that originates outside of me, but rather originates within me as my other, I make it my other. You know, it is my moment, but ultimately it's there to constitute me rather than, you know, something else. And um, what do you guys think about the examples of consciousness uh, as a concrete, a very concrete form of a being for itself. Uh, any comments That's on good. that? That's probably the best example that we could use.
the danger with this sort of example is just that people might try to interpret this as like, oh, this is Hegel's blah, 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 you know, Berkeleyan sort of idealism, even though that's like pretty clearly not what he's up to here. But I imagine this is where you would go to try to furnish an interpretation like that. Uh, yeah, I suppose, yeah, that's a that is one, one passage that criticism. people... But one. I think that when you really think about it, you have to think about it to for it to make sense, so you're doing it consciously, so you're defeating it. <laughs> like you're defeating your own criticism by thinking about it. I don't follow. What In what way? Because you're consciously thinking about it. You're doing what he's saying, so obviously it holds. Well, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, but that'd be like only if you understand it that way. Like you know, the other people will just who just want to criticize, use a cheap criticism. You know, they can just go look and see. You know, he's an, a so-called quote-unquote metaphysical idealist. Yeah, it's not that though. He makes it. Which explicit. I saw that by the way. Like on uh, there was an R on R S philosophy. There was a question about that. They're like, you know, who are these meta? You know, it's like, what do people think about the metaphysical idealists? And like, really, when you think about it, uh, there's only one person in in like the general history of philosophy that people know about that has anything that can be called what people think metaphysical idealism is, which is Berkeley. And uh, no one else really has that kind of idealism. Everybody else, uh, you know, has some weird idealism, which is just uh, very, very different. So it's structural idealism, you know, it's kind of like Plato, um, you know, epistemological idealisms. But like, you don't really have this, like, metaphysical idealism as in, like, things are literally, like, thoughts as in, like, representations, you know, mind or something. Right, and Hegel warned in the preface and the introduction as sort of a way of reading them. But yeah, I'd like to at least go over the, the example of consciousness again more slowly, so uh, going back a bit. Um, after like that M dash uh, on the next page, in representing to itself an intended object which it feels or intuits and so forth, Consciousness already contains in itself, as consciousness, the determination of being for itself. That is, it has in it the content of that object, which is thus an idealization. Even as it intuits, or in general becomes involved in the negative of itself, in the other it abides with itself. So, you know, this is kind of like uh, taking a Kantian point of consciousness truly never can go uh, beyond itself. And if it does go beyond itself, it is because that is what consciousness truly is. You know, uh, the fact that consciousness can grasp other things, which are not just uh, figments of our minds, but, you know, are real things out there, uh, is one of the proofs of, you know, the idealism of, uh, quote unquote, the, quote unquote, the idealism, the idealization of uh, things out there. You know, the fact that the consciousness can do that at all is is proof that, you know, they share the same uh, ideal structure, in a sense. Ideal as in your abstraction. But here he's talking about the representations, for example. If you, you're a Kantian, you say, well, you know, the only things that are in the mind are representations of the things out there, but not the thing in itself. Uh, you still kind of are saying, well, then consciousness really is a being for itself, you know. Uh, and everything that consciousness does, everything consciousness deals with, is only that which is really from consciousness and for consciousness. You know, consciousness posits the very things, uh, you know, that it knows, the very things it deals with. Mm. And therefore, it only abides with itself. Because if you come across something you don't understand, you are not consciously aware of it. Or you're consciously aware that you don't understand it or something. But you can then become aware of it, you know. But yeah, we like, always uh, say that things are brought forth into consciousness. That means we're acknowledging them, you know. That's why it's for itself, or, you know, a self uh, being for itself. 
Yeah, and that it has no real other that, uh, uh, at least within its own uh, realm of like awareness, it it doesn't deal with. You know, to, uh, then you know Freudian can easily come in and say, well, what about the unconscious? Clearly, that's there, and you know, then you kind of be screwed if you stuck by that interpretation, because then you know, they're kind of right. Works. I think it it has to like. Um, it's just another dimension. I don't see it as like a defeat of what Hegel's saying at all. Uh, well, no, because uh, because if we understand what Hegel's saying as uh, you know here, the thing about representation, you know, talking about what is in, within consciousness as within consciousness is one thing. Talking about what determines consciousness is a whole other thing. So that's kind of what Freudians would do. You know, the unconscious is something prior to consciousness, but which determines part of consciousness. Yeah. And it also uh, isn't, it's obviously not acknowledged, but it can be brought forth into consciousness. Yeah, and you once it's brought forth into consciousness, then it no longer has like a, this absolute determining power. Yeah. That's the only like thing that I can think is like a mystical force uh, within consciousness. The subconscious and the unconscious. But yeah, like the, the thing I wanted to say about representation is... Uh, just to summarize that is uh, uh, what Hegel says there, you know, um, you know, that is it has in it the content of that object, which is thus an idealization, even as it intuits or in general becomes involved in the negative of itself and the other it abides with itself. That is, uh, if there really are, you know, since there really are things out there, you know, which are independent of us uh, to one degree or another generally. Uh, and obviously those things aren't what are in our minds. You know, what are in our minds are representations or idealizations. And yet, nonetheless, those things are brought into our minds by consciousness, you know, by a process of consciousness, which uh, makes them consciousness' own products in a way. And so, you know, even with dealing with it, the negative itself, you know, with an ab so called absolute independent other, uh, nonetheless, it is fully abiding within itself. So uh, continuing, being for itself is the polemical negative relating to the limiting other and uh, through this negation of the other is being reflected within itself. Even though side by side with this imminent turning back of consciousness and the ideality of its object, the reality this, of this object is also retained for, this object, uh, for the object is at the same time known as an external existence. Okay, I clearly lost my place. Oh, you're rereading the same paragraph, right? Yeah. Okay, okay. Just making sure. Just let me, let me reread that then. Being for itself is the polemical negative relating to the limiting other, and uh, through this negation of the other is being reflected within itself, even though side by side with this imminent turning back of consciousness and the ideality of its object, the reality of this object is also retained for the object is at the same time known as an external existence. You know, what I was saying uh, earlier, which was, uh, you know, uh, the other is other, but it is the other of me, rather than me being the other of it. So, you know, I subsume yeah. that other as being constitutive of me and posited by me, in a sense. He's saying, is he saying here being for itself is... Uh lacking the consideration of the other uh it doesn't rec it doesn't recognize the other as truly other it is only it's a moment of me of itself okay. you know the other this, uh, you know being for itself can be said to be the other of the other but the that other which is the other of me is the other of me as yeah. opposed to me being the other of it yeah. But the same holds for from its perspective too. Uh, well, I mean, no, this is the if the, it's conscious. The, yeah, if it's a conscious one. 
Yeah. But at this point, it's not that same. It's like because this is transcendence of the otherness. Yeah, yeah, it looks I like, know. You know, my otherness that. and its otherness are both, you know, constitutive of being for itself. Yeah. We're not considering <clears throat> like multiple others uh, or multiple things, just one. And each has a being for itself, but we're only considering one right now. Uh, for the object. Yeah, is so. Uh... I- existence well yeah so like in in being for itself you know uh, the other of the other the others are real you know they do exist they're just not absolute existences they're not external they're they're not they're not truly external to me like you know they're only partially seemingly external so for consciousness you know the object is you know an external existence And yet it is an existence for me in a way. Yeah. Whether it is, whether I'm aware of it or not, you know, I treat it that way. And I think that's what we actually do when we really deal with much of the world. You know, we really do treat the world as, yeah, it exists, but it, you know, and the way we don't think about it, but we, the way we go about it is, you know, that external world, is, yeah, it's external. It really exists independently, but nonetheless, it's a world for me. So consciousness is thus phenomenal, or it is this dualism. On the one side, it knows an external object which is other than it. On the other side, it is for itself, has this intended object in it as idealized, abides not only by this other, but therein abides also within itself. Yeah. Uh, And the example Uh, of that uh, that I would give is the example of uh, knowledge in which... uh, Knowledge is, uh, or concepts, you have the objects, whatever. That you have the re- you have like an apple in front of you. It's what's inside your head, you know, that you're thinking about is not that material existent being itself. You know, it's a, you could say it's a representation, a concept, whatever. But nonetheless, that thing which is inside your mind is yours, and is produced by you, and has a structure set by whatever whim you will. You know, it's not really uh, uh, something that's truly other to you. And yet, supposing that you capture, like, the real essence of the external object, uh, that is still something that is within you. Uh, it is yeah. a thought. Is <laughs> But it's nothing bad. It's not well, just... No. Oh well, you can't really know the object because it's just in your mind or whatever. You know, it doesn't matter. Oh yeah, and the point is obviously to repeat again: uh, the concept is consciousness. You know, uh, it's an object of consciousness created by consciousness, constituted in consciousness, uh, constituted by consciousness. Um, You know, it just happened. It also coincides with the. the essence of the object out there, therefore, you know, being a truth and objective. Uh, so continuing, self-consciousness, on the contrary, is being for itself brought to completion and posited. The side of reference to another, to an external object, is removed. Self-consciousness is thus the nearest example of the presence of infinity, granted of a still abstract infinity, but one in which is of a totally different concrete determination than the being for itself in general, whose infinity still has only qualitative determinateness. So in self-consciousness, uh, you have basically two... <laughs> which would be the proper way to, to phrase this? Would it be like uh, two infinite finitudes or hmm, or yeah. finite infinities? <laughs> um, I think okay. it would be infinite finitudes. Yeah, I think it's infinite infinite. Finitudes. Because both of them are self transcending towards the other. Yeah. Because no, it couldn't be finite infinities. I'm thinking about it. Yeah, it has to be infinite finitudes. Because infinite modifies finitudes. Uh, 
I mean, they, they kind of look the same depending on what point you're taking. But yeah, you know, two self-consciousness, two individuals uh, face each other, have each other as the object, and there you have like this whole loop. And in the phenomenology of spirit, there's a section on this, and there's also a section on this on the anthropology, I think. Yep. Um, but in basically, uh, it has to do with the concept of self-consciousness, and uh, I'm not going to really go into it. Uh, you can look at my blog on that in the Empyrean Trail. It's uh, linked under my phenomenology section. But all right, uh, we're done with that paragraph. Uh, perhaps took a bit too long to uh, to retread it, but I'd rather be like I like to just be uh, um, thorough and safe with Hegel than rather not. Yeah, yeah, we have to be thorough. So uh, subsection A: existence and being for itself. As already mentioned, being for itself is infinity that has sunk into simple being. It is existence in so far as in this it is existence in so far as in the now positive form of the immediacy of being, the negative nature of infinity, which is a negation of negation, is only as negation in general as infinite qualitative determinateness. But in such a determinateness, wherein it is existence, being is at once also distinguished from this very being for itself, which is only as infinite qualitative determinateness. Nevertheless, existence is at the same time a moment of being for itself, for the latter certainly contains being affected by negation. So the determinateness which in itself as such is an other, and a being for other, is bent back into the infinite unity of being for itself, and the moment of existence is present in the being for itself as being for one. All right. So I uh Definitely like to go bear over that a bit slower. So rereading again. As already mentioned, being for itself is infinity that has sunk into simple being. Uh, you know, uh, this uh, the movement of sublation always happens. You know, you have a whole dynamic, and then you can go and said, "Ah, this whole dynamic is." There you go, new concept. So the whole movement of uh, true infinity itself is. Therefore, you now have being for itself. Uh, it is existence insofar as in the now posited form of the immediacy of being, the negative nature of infinity, which is negation of negation, is only as negation in general, as infinite qualitative determinateness. So, uh, existence is negated being, even though, like, uh, it's... Or am I remembering that wrong? I mean, negated being is determinate being. Existence is just their unity. It's actually one of the confusing little things at the beginning of chapter two, uh, like, yeah. uh, what's the difference between existence and determinate being, really? And, uh... I kind of go back and forth between, uh, sometimes I think I, I understand the difference, uh, some moments I don't. I didn't even remember that there was a difference. I thought it was just a translation thing, like a preference. Yeah, I thought that too. Uh... Yeah, maybe, you know, I have, I actually didn't check the other translations to see what they say. Well, some used, uh, I know in the other translation I have of this, they use determinate being instead of existence. And for determinate, do they use determinateness instead of determinate being afterwards? No. No, determinateness no. is different. Yeah, that's the thing. Existence, yeah. that's what I mean. Like, existence, there's existence, which is determinate being. 
yeah. from that you get determinateness. Yeah. Yeah, determinateness is a quality, uh, a quality, a quality, right? Uh, quality is a a determinate version of determinateness. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so here he's saying uh, that uh, it's an existence because it is the hmm. posited form of the immediacy of being so at first like a determinate being is the first thing we come to because you know that's that's the immediate form that it takes right yeah that's the thing like there's immediacy is also a, like there are <laughs> there are i think like about three or four different equivalencies that go on and they have very subtle meanings yeah. of difference in which existence is immediacy, existence is determinateness, uh, existence is... Yeah... Yeah, those three. Existence, immediacy, and determinateness are in a way equivalent, but in another way not. Yeah. Uh, they imply similar things, but uh, their specific term use uh, goes towards different things. Yeah, they're not interchangeable by any means. They kind of are, but they're not. They don't mean the exact... They don't imply the exact same thing. So when you have an immediacy, you have existence. Anytime you have an immediacy, existence, bam. Anytime you have existence, obviously you have negation. Uh, and, and you have determinateness. But anyway, so he says, uh, it is existence insofar as in the now positive form of the immediacy of being the negative nature of infinity. I don't think he's saying being. Yeah, yeah, and he's not saying yeah, being okay. as in the category okay. of being. Yeah, that's he's just I got like, tripped up until I read the rest. Okay. You know, in that existence, in that being for itself is the negative nature of infinity, which is yeah. the negation of negation, is only mm -hmm. as negation in general, as infinite qualitative determinateness. So this is just negation, like literally what it says, the negation of negation. It's, you know, a negation turning back onto itself. It is, but this is a negation in general. And I don't quite know what negation in in uh, another form would be, but, you know, we haven't got there really. Well, actually, no, never mind. I'd like negation as negation as such, I, I would suppose is what kind of he might mean by general here. Either way, I mean, I get uh, the whole infinite quality of determinateness, which is uh, a mouthful, but yeah. uh, uh, it's yeah, very makes... precise. It's but... very precise to what it is, in which being for itself is negated, therefore qualitative. You know, it's it's determinate. Well, it's negated because it is determinate. It is qualitative in that this negation implies a duality of opposition of, you know, real, a, of a real and a negative of, you know, the other of the other. And it is infinite because it is only dealing with itself. Negation of negation. You know, it's negation simply mingling with negation itself. Nothing more. And it, and this is all within itself. So, you know, absolute negativity. Mm -hmm. uh, but in such a determinateness, wherein it is existence, being is at once also distinguished from this being from this very being for itself, which is such only as infinite qualitative determinateness. Nevertheless, existence is at the same time a moment of being for itself, for the latter certainly contains being affected by negation. Contains being affected by negation. He really needs, like, wh whoever translates this needs capital Bs for being. <laughs> That's what I always yeah, do. Yeah, I, I didn't like. I, I thought that was the last something one. Quite I thought useful. was. Yeah, the last one I thought was being. He was talking about being, but it wasn't. It was just you know the gerund being.
He says, but in such a determinus, wherein it is existence, being is at once also distinguished from this very being for itself, which is such only as infinite qualitative determinus. So, you know, a being for itself is not being. Uh, is not existence. So, like, God, the absolute, would be an example of being for itself, right? Uh, yeah. 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 This would actually be a very, a very basic concept of the absolute that we have here. Just like a, you know, it's a cake like infinity. This is basically a, starting to get into a determinate forms of infinity. This is just a weird sentence, you know. Uh, <laughs> but in such a determinist wherein it is existence, that is, uh, wherein it being a uh, being for itself is existence. Mm -hmm. Being is at once also distinguished from this very being for itself, which is such only as infinite qualitative determinateness. Nevertheless, existence is at the same time a moment of being for itself. The latter run contains being affected by negation. So this is starting to get into things in which. Uh, like it's we can't really legitimately talk about it <laughs> in the way I want to talk about it because it makes it makes more sense the way I want to talk about it. But uh... okay, so there's being for itself, but the existence of being for itself is not being for itself it is in those moments which are not for themselves like the other of the other in the finite you know being for itself is the infinite the existence of the infinite mm -hmm. is finitude yeah yeah does that make sense which Jeff? sounds weird when you, but it makes sense yeah that makes sense yeah well it if people have been listening up to now, like you know, Maybe, they know yeah, what we're talking yeah, okay. about. <laughs> right, of good. course, like this, this can't, this doesn't make sense if you just come out of nowhere. But no, this makes perfect yeah. sense with what he's been saying already. So you know, in that way, existence is at the same time a moment of being for itself. That is, being here, being and existence are kind of being interchanged. For the latter certainly contains being affected by negation. And so um, I think I noticed this like uh, some t somewhere in chapter two when we were reading it. And I, I sort of pay attention to the fact that, you know, there's this strange uh, shifting equivalence, which does not exactly mean the same thing, but nonetheless can be do done like uh, legitimately in which guess what being what, what was being it's a structure of immediacy. <laughs> what is immediacy It's a structure of existence. <laughs> Yeah. You know, what is existence a structure of quality? You can have this whole chain of, of certainly equivalence and you can you can phrase this in so many ways, it's it gets crazy. And each one is slightly different from the others, but nonetheless can be chained logically to the others. Uh, so the determinateness which in existence as such is an other and a being for other is bent back into the infinite unity of being for itself. And the moment of existence is present in the being for itself as being for one. Ah, so then mm -hmm. existence applies, existence as such applied to being f for itself as such uh, is a moment of differentiating the whole from its parts all yeah. of a sudden. Because we can make that it's it's a legitimate determinateness uh, that's there in the structure already, uh, and in case you you know that doesn't seem to make sense, or those of you listening, uh, uh, think back to like how uh, becoming works. Uh, becoming is a totality in which uh, the moment of becoming exists, 
you know, it is that total movement, and yet uh, we c- we can and we must speak of this total movement as something itself different from each moment of the movement. Mm-hmm. And, you know, uh, seeing as, like, I've mainly been reading uh, Marx's really crappy uh, attempts at Hegelianism from the 1844 manuscripts lately in the last couple of weeks, um, I really have come to appreciate that difference because Marx does not respect that difference at all. <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, Marx is constantly collapsing, you know, the unity, the being for itself into its uh, moments of being for other and saying, oh, look, they're identical. You know, I can say they're identical. They're not. I'm trying to, like, phrase this in my head in a way that would be easily understood by anyone. The whole is more than its parts. Yeah. But its parts matter and comprise it. Uh, Yeah, and when he says, like, you know, it's uh, the being for one, well, the parts only exist because of the whole, and the example is, just give an example of life. Every example of life works this way. Uh, the heart exists for the body, for the sake of the organism. The lungs exist for the sake of the organism. The cells exist for the sake of the total organism. They do not exist. They have on their, their own. own. Fun- yeah, they have their own function, but they, n- nonetheless, uh, they one without the, one. the others would not even do anything. Really, it would just yeah, they, they would exist, even die. Uh, <laughs> they they have being for one, and that is true. Yeah, you know, so uh, the moments or the parts exist only because and for the whole you know uh, you the living organism do not exist for the sake of your lungs your lungs exist for the sake of you Uh, your you know uh, your genes exist for the sake of the living organisms not for yeah, but I don't know if uh, the example of the life or the body would be a, go- a great example because the being for itself, like without the other, it couldn't even do anything, like I said. Yeah, so I was thinking more uh, like a person well, who alo- like... does things alone and they're doing things for themselves and that's fine, but they also do things for others, like if they're around others or whatever, you know. And then that right. comprises the society or whatever. Hmm. Because the an organ by itself, yes, a heart has its function, but without the other, its being for itself is nothing, really. I mean, it doesn't function without the others. Well, I mean, well, with see, the body example... Because... Yeah, go ahead. I guess it's an arbitrary point, sorry. Um, like, wouldn't your body kind of be for uh, like the lung for example because the lung is your body it's not your entire body but it's part of your body it's it's, yeah that's the thing like for which what is the developing principle really it's not for the sake of your heart Uh, it's for a total organism the unity of the whole thing that's the being for itself so you you as a living individual are your whole body each part of your body exists for the sake of the entire function of your whole body. Like it does, it they you know obviously they're not conscious. Your bones aren't conscious. Your muscles aren't conscious. But nonetheless, they exist as they are for the sake of the one. Yeah, you know, they don't. The, the one does not exist for their sake. You know, bone. Your body didn't. Flesh didn't come about so that bones could walk around. This is basically what I'm saying. It doesn't make sense. So it, with the, the, I think the only with the example that really does work is, is, is the living organism because that's the only time you really do have this sense of the being for one in which the total uh, organism as such is the only one that really works uh, in a concrete form. Yeah, but there are other things that have that structure. Like the yeah, world, but it's, for example. Yeah, but it's more abstract and it doesn't, yeah. it's not as intuitive. With the living thing, it's a lot more I intuitive. Guess so. All right, yeah, that's true. I guess my mind works differently than, like, uh... <laughs> okay. Let, let's put it in terms people, of, but... of something you actually yeah. loved: an orchestra. Okay. The orchestra. Yeah. Each member comes in of what for the sake of playing the whole musical piece. You know, the orchestra is assembled for the sake of the performance as a whole. Yeah. Each 
I was actually member. gonna bring up that example. Yeah, each member is there for the sake of the one, for the sake of the art piece as a whole. Yeah, that can be taken in uh, by themselves and be the part that they play is is their being for itself or whatever. Yeah, but then that's just breaking it apart into uh, other constituents I know, I'm and just lower saying, levels. Yeah, I'm just saying like, okay, there's a performance of. Beethoven's uh, Ode to Joy, where one person is out in the on the street playing a part of it, and then other people join in, and then they create the piece. Like at first, it was just him playing, and then you know it's an ensemble and it's played. So it's like that. Like there's the being for itself, and then being for other, and then the total comprises the whole. Uh, you know, the the all of them individually add up to the whole. Or, well, what about free jazz? All the <laughs> musicians in free jazz are playing for themselves. They're playing different songs. Yeah, no. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, but it okay. makes one piece in total. Yeah, but is that piece, was that piece intended? Like, was it really yeah. intended? Well, yeah, they all came together. They had to collaborate. They didn't just record separately. Well, it's free jazz. Yeah, but it's free-flowing. It's, it's free musical expression of freedom. Yeah, but it was like the, it doesn't like have it, to. They don't have to know what they're going to play necessarily, for it to comprise. True. The so whole. you know, so they came together for some artistic unity. They didn't. They didn't pre-plan it, but yeah. nonetheless, it was for the sake of for one. You know, it's not just for yeah. But their music, they're, they're, it's not like they're amateur musicians and they're just playing their own song. Well, no, that's that's what I'm saying. Okay, I like, think like the problem yeah, like you're having is that you're trying great, to think yeah. too much at once. Oh, you know, sorry. You're, you're talking. You're you're thinking too many levels of being for one because you're thinking you're talking about the okay, being for one of the the individuals musicians, whereas when I talk about the orchestra, I just mean the being for one of the entire piece, because then you can okay, talk about okay. the being for one of everything there. No, I was talking about being for itself. Yeah, being for itself as well. I mean, it's like you're talking about <laughs> the being for itself of different levels, but the being for itself is a being for one. This is your fault. You brought up something I love, and I went autistic about it, so let's just move on. <laughs> well, no, that's good. I mean, I think this is, like, the most discussion we've really had since Chapter 1, where, you know, we go into concrete examples and, like, actually talk. Well, yeah, because I had brain fog during Chapter 2. I mean, I understood it. It was just, you know, I didn't have much to contribute, so I wasn't... All right. Section... Subsection B. Being for one. This moment gives expression to how the finite is in its unity with the infinite or as an idealization. Being for itself does not have negation in it as a determinateness or limit and consequently also not as reference to an existence other than it. Although this moment is now being designated as being for one, there is yet nothing at hand for which it would be. There is not the one of which it would be the moment. There is in fact nothing of the sort yet fixed in being for itself, that for which something, and there is no something here, so, uh, being for itself is not something itself. It's not exist. It's not an existence itself. That's interesting. Hmm. So, I mean, it's basically like this is what I said. Like, you know, this is this is, gets into the very interesting portions, which uh, are starting to uh, make the first determinate forms of the concept, which is way later. Being for for itself is basically the universal. <laughs> And it has a structure. It yeah. already has the latent structures of the universal. And guess what? The universal, as such, universal? does not exist. Being for itself is the universal, is what you said? Yeah, because it doesn't exist. You know, its actual existence oh, is okay. the, the other things within it. Yeah. You know, it itself is not limited. So, you know, in itself, it has no limit. It's the things which exist within it, which... Uh, or which it exists as that have limits, but it itself does not. It is infinite. Well, what he's saying here is being for one doesn't exist yet, because there's no one that it that the being for itself could be a moment of, right? 
Yeah. So it's just we're just concerned with being for itself right now. So can, uh, starting that again, uh, there is in fact nothing of the sort yet fixed in being for itself. That for which something and there is no something here would be. What the other side in general should be is likewise a moment itself only being for one, not yet a one. What we have before us, therefore, is still an undistinguishedness of two sides that may suggest themselves in the being for one. There is only one being for another. And since this is only one being for another, it is also only being for one. There is only the one ideality of that for which, or in which, there should be a determination as moment, and of that which should be the moment in it. Being for one and being for itself do not therefore constitute two genuine determinacies, each as against the other, inasmuch as the distinction is momentarily assumed and we speak of a being for itself. It is this very being for itself as the sublated being of otherness that refers itself to itself as to the sublated other, is therefore for one. In its other it refers itself only to itself, and idealization is necessary is necessarily for one, but it is not for an other. The one for which it is, is only itself. The I, therefore, spirit in general, or God, are idealizations, because they are infinite. As existence, which are for themselves, however, they are not ide ideationally different from that which is for one. For if they were different, they would be only immediate, or, precisely, they would only be existence and a being for another. For if the moment of being for one did not attach to them, it is not they themselves, but an other that would be that which is for them. God is therefore for himself, insofar as he, insofar he is himself, that which is for him. I think I just made a revelation that you probably realize, but I didn't, that immediacy is only temporary. Yep. Shit. Being for itself and being for one are not, therefore, diverse significations of ideality, but essential, inseparable moments of it. Ah. So this is, like, super determinateness, basically. Like, this is what, like... A really a <laughs> this is concrete uh, determinateness beyond even limitation, which uh, you know diverse significations of ideality, but essential inseparable moments of it. So to have things which are finite, to have things which are determinate, to have things which are uh, ideal in uh, the sense of abstraction uh, uh, is to have beings something that has being for itself and being for one. And it must be this so. That I know. Explain what you mean, what revelation you, you're talking about. Oh. I just said that, uh, that immediacy is only temporary. Meaning? Well, he says, for if they were different, they would only be immediate. They would only be existence and the being for another. But those are temporary things. I don't know. It made sense in my head uh, that... That immediacy is temporary. I guess everything is temporary, though, so it doesn't really matter. Well, I think the deeper stuff came in chapter two, where, you know, he basically, like, in the middle of it said, oh, by the way, self-mediation is immediate, is immediation. Yeah. Which is, guess what? Like, it's like formal logic, A equals A. What do you think that is? Why do we have to say that? 
you know, to to say an identity. It's a self mediation. It has to be. Yeah. Like it is immediacy itself. The where the very way we think about it is the very way it is. You know, if it was immediate to itself, it would have to mediate itself. Otherwise, it would collapse yeah. into just uh, a nothingness. Yeah, it doesn't have to mediate. And even then, is, you, yeah. you always have the problem. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think I also mentioned it in the stuff on chapter two. It's like, just think about it. I mean, like, uh, like literally the being of being is nothing and the nothing of nothing is being <laughs> because if it is if either of them are you know in ab if either of them are in absolute form the only way to to get anything that is possibly like intelligible is to do the one thing you can do which is self-mediate to just mediate the thing through itself by engaging it But anyways, let's reread this more slowly because it was. Uh, I think it was uh, pretty clear, but uh, not fully clear. There's some things I think I didn't understand, like so, the. Uh... The what? The where he says we speak of, and then he has a being for itself. Like yeah, is he so just saying? Just one. I don't know why there's a dash between A and being for itself. That's the first time I've seen that. Well, we'll see. So, um, starting from the top again, this moment gives expression to how the finite is in its unity with the infinite or as an idealization. Being for itself does not have negation in it as a determinateness or limit, and consequently also not as reference to an existence other than it. So this is where, like, uh, so being for itself does not have negation in it as a determinateness or limit. So it's not like something where, you know, uh, the, uh, the negation in it, in itself, the other of the other, was uh, its limitation. That was its determinateness. Yeah. But being for itself has no limit. Therefore, it has, yeah. no cannot have any negation in it as a determinateness or limit. there's nothing outside it that we're considering. Yeah, or within it. I mean, it's its own. Yeah. Yeah, there's no lower level, too. You're right. And consequently, also not as reference to an existence other than it. So it has no negation in it. And, you know, the same thing we learned in something, which was uh, the limitation is in it and it is also even though we normally think it's outside it nonetheless it is actually in it and to be in it is just very much the very way we define the outsideness of it but there is no outsideness for being for itself therefore there can be no innerness as well there can be there can be no inner limit Although this moment is now being designated as being for one, there is yet nothing at hand for which it would be. There is not the one of which it would be the moment. There is, in fact, nothing of the sort yet fixed in being for itself. That for which something, and there is no something here, would be. What the other side in general should be is likewise a moment itself only being for one, not yet a one. That sentence is kind of, it seems like a comma splice. Yeah. But I get it, yeah. So, uh, 
Let me just review that again. There is, in fact, nothing of the sort yet fixed in being for itself. Oh, no, it's not. Never mind. Right, let me review that as the last sentence as well. <laughs> I'm good. So, okay, although this moment is now being designated as being for one, there is yet nothing at hand for which it would be. There is not the one of which it would be the moment. Yeah, that means uh, that oh, yeah. since, we're not considering the being for one yet. Yeah, not yet. Well, not only that, it's like since being for itself literally does not exist, what one would, it be, uh, would we be even be speaking of? Because it has no negation, you know, it has no negation in it as a determinateness or limit, so it doesn't exist, and consequently also not as reference to an existence other than it. Yeah. Well, okay, yeah, but it's all it's saying. All he's saying is that, you know, we're talking about being for itself. We're not talking about being for itself as a moment of being for one. We're not talking about the part comprising the whole or going being constitutive of the whole we're just talking about the the part itself or you know it's not even a part yet it's just what it is the first thing does that make sense josh Al? am i saying it wrong yeah, I think it does. I'm not sure. This is like this is like dense as hell. Yeah. I mean, it's Hegel, so I'm, I expected this, but uh, it's giving me a definitely a, making me jog my brain. Yeah, I mean, he's saying that. Of course, it will go on to comprise a being, you know, exist as a being for one. It will act in the future as a being for one. But at this moment, we're not considering it as a being for one. We're considering it as a being for itself alone. Because he says, although this moment is now being designated as being for one, there isn't anything at hand yet right now for which it would be because there's no one yet. yeah the thing is yeah there is no one and like the thing is yeah. like uh in the the last section uh, last paragraph before this one uh he basically is he says something along the lines of being for itself is a sort of a function like determinateness in which determinateness isn't a thing determinateness is a thing is a moment which uh then deter you know determines other things Mm -hmm. Determinateness itself, like, is not. It's a function, not a thing. Basically, it's a doing, not a being. Yeah. So, being for itself is not yet being for one because it's not itself a thing. You know, you got to be talking about a thing itself. Being for itself is only the function of negation of negation. Yeah. As absolute. So being for itself does not have negation in it as a determinateness or limit, and consequently also not as reference to an existence other than it. Although this moment is now being designated as being for one, there is yet nothing at hand for which it would be. There is not the one of which it would be the moment. There is in fact nothing of the sort yet fixed in being for itself, that for which something, and there is no something here, would be what the other side in general should be is likewise a moment itself only being for one. Yeah. Okay, the uh, the way he's saying it is uh, a being for itself does not necessarily presuppose a being for one because there could be nothing outside it actually but there obviously there is and we know there is but he's saying don't think about how you know that there's a it's a being for one just consider it as it's being for itself and then he says that the being for itself that for which something 
and there is no something here would be uh, aside what the other side in general should be. Uh, so he's saying that for which something would be is likewise a moment. Itself only being for one, not yet a one. That is a noun. Well, it's a noun clause, I guess. <laughs> hmm, that's just a weird sentence. Okay, there is, in yeah. fact, nothing of the sort yet fixed in being for itself. Yeah. He's just saying, like, being, yeah. being for itself doesn't presuppose a being for one necessarily. So there's nothing fixed in it that makes it a moment of a being for, or a, a moment of a one, you know. And let's see, that for which something would be what the other side in general should be is likewise a moment itself only being for one and not yet a one. So even if we consider being for itself as a being for one, we're not presupposing a one yet. We're just saying that they're, you know, itself is a being for one. It's not yet the yeah, whole. We would, it's just, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So that was just like a really weird phrasing. So we could have something yeah, and something, and we could say something is being for itself. Oh, well, no, no. It, something would be a being for one, and, you know, it actually is not an absolute. It's the one that is absolute. Mm -hmm. uh, but in saying that it's being for one, that something that the other and the other are both being for one, you know, they exist for the sake of the one, or they exist because of one, or as expressions of the ones, blah, 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 whatever you want to say. Yeah. Uh, you haven't yet said what the one is. Even though it's implied. Yeah. I mean, it's implied already being for one, but it's those things which are being for one are not the one. Or not yet a one. I mean, it's a sort of like bit like a, a problem mysticism. You nervous, like you know, everything is one. Um, oh, you haven't said what the one really, and he says like you know, the one is God. You have you actually actually said shit. Yeah. And uh, you know, then you ask, well, what is the one? You're like, well, it's God, and it's like, well, yeah, but, but what is it? What is that? What's its purpose? What the, what's the point? And then you they you kind of say. you kind of fall. Yeah, you never they never say because they can't because in order to do that you'd have to fall into an essence relationship of, well, God is really everything right here already, in, in which case you're like, well, then why the fuck are we talking about it? <laughs> All that was is and shall be, but what does that mean? It's just abstract you know, God, still. Yeah, and you, some people literally say, you know, God is existence. Well, then who cares? You know, you actually said nothing at all. Uh, but uh, let's continue. Uh, what we have before us, therefore, is still an undistinguishedness of two sides that may suggest themselves in the being for one. There is only one being for another. And since this is only one being for another, it is also only being for one. There is only the one ideality of that for which or in which there should be a determination as moment and of that which should be the moment in it. Being for one and being for itself do not therefore constitute two genuine determinacies, each as against the other. So that's pretty key right there. They don't constitute two genuine determinacies. So they're not op they're not actually opposites, at least not that we know of yet. And they're not really determinacies. Because unless we can determine which is the one in which are the many, or which is the one for which the other exists, 
we haven't actually said anything. We haven't determined anything, really. You know, and that last sentence really gets to the crux of that. You know, what we have before is therefore is still an undistinguishedness of two sides that may suggest themselves in the being for one. There's only one being for another. You know, let's take the other of the other, or the two others, two somethings. And since this is only one being for another, it is also only being for one. There is only the one ideality of that for which or in which there should be a determination as moment and of that which should be a moment in it. So unless we, unless we can make the, the, the definite determinate split and actually determine which is which, uh, and we just say, well, you know, it's the one, uh, yeah, I agree with him, you know, then you don't have a real genuine determinacy. You you haven't actually uh, determined anything at all. Which is goes exactly to the point of uh, what I was saying earlier about the mystics who go and say, you know, everything is one. And then you ask them, what is the one? And they're like, well, the one is everything here. Uh, you haven't actually, de you haven't made the split, you haven't actually said anything true, or uh, you haven't really said anything. Because in order to have a concept, you have to have a determinacy. It must exist, and to exist, you have to have the duality right there. You have to have the split, in which you could make the distinguishing. So continuing, inasmuch as the distinction is momentarily assumed and we speak of a being for itself, it is this very being for itself as the sublated being of otherness that refers itself to itself as to the sublated other, is therefore for one. In its other, it refers itself only to itself. An idealization is, ne is necessarily for one. But it is not for an other. The one for which it is, is only itself. So what do you think about that one? I agree. I'm just kidding. I don't know. Hmm. I mean, idealization just re -read is it, yeah. Sorry, I was writing my tweet about it. How we're having a good discussion. <laughs> All right, just rereading that whole little section. Inasmuch as the distinction is momentarily assumed and we speak of a being for itself, it is this being, is, it is this very being for itself as the sublated being of otherness that refers itself to itself as to the sublated other is therefore for one. In its other, it refers itself only to itself. An idealization is necessarily for one, but it is not for an other. The one for which it is, is only itself. So, I mean, that's a bit of a, a mind twister. And so I, I, I feel I get it, and I also feel I don't. Because it seems that with being for itself, we've only made this collapse of identity and said, you know, this is what the one actually is. Hmm. But then, yeah. it, you know, it's, it's like the one is many. But then what is the one and what, the are, one the, what are the many? So when he says, because he says we assume and we speak of a being for itself, you know, we assume the distinction, but we haven't actually made the distinction, right? Yeah. That's kind of the problem we've had, like, uh, that's been going on here, I think. So it's really, like he says, uh, that there has been no distinction actually made between the one uh, and the many, the, the infinite and yeah. the finite. Because if you were to make such a distinction, then how can the one truly be one if it can be separated? How far did you get? Did you get to the, the last sentence? 
that's separated off. Uh, yeah, the I got to the one before the M dash, the I, therefore. Oh, okay. I read ahead. That's why I was lost. Okay. Um, ID selection is necessarily for one, but it's not for an other. Okay, so the one is a being for itself, because it is only itself as a one. It's just a different being for itself than the being for itself we were talking about previously, I guess. Or maybe it's the same one. I mean, yeah, they're, think they're the both being for itself, I mean, like... so you can't really distinguish a being for itself from another being for itself. Yeah, I mean, think like uh, the concept of, uh, you know, a cow or whatever it's... Since I use that in my uh, epoche thing, yeah, you know the, the cow as such, like in its full totality, as you know, the total species uh, concept. Uh, that's the one, which is yes. for itself, and all the moments before that are idealizations for the one. They're not idealizations so the form for of the cow? another. Yeah, is that what you're talking about? Okay. And everything that goes along with it that we just identify, that we associate with cows. Yeah, and those things aren't for some other. You know, they are. Yeah. For the one. Yeah. But I mean, that's that's kind of a a bad example in that you know this. This is all, it's like Hegel's talking about an absolute form here, and cows are not exactly an absolute form, you know, they, they really true. don't have they full could, being for one. They could have to be subject to evolution and change and no longer even be considered cows or whatever. Um, but yeah, uh, that's why he uses the example of God, I think. I think it'll make more sense as we go on, because that's a good example, I think. Well, I mean, obviously, for it. us, the one is the absolute, so it would have to be. Not quite. What do you mean? The one isn't absolute. It's kind of the point Wasn't, of this. One <laughs> isn't absolute? Well, yeah, it's the not absolute, absolute. isn't one. <laughs> no. I mean, this is what he like. The next sentence like shows it. You know, he says the I, therefore, spirit in general, or God, are idealizations because they are infinite. Yeah. There you go. Oh. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. Literally everything, <laughs> everything is not absolute. Like, no moment that can be separated is actually absolute. Yeah. Uh, like, uh, yeah, the, the way I would explain the absolute as such is the absolute is very, it's a very process, like, it's what it's at the end of chapter two. It's the very process of the infinite, which is actually absolute. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, the process of the infinite generates itself is, you know, a moment of the absolute. So the I, therefore, spirit in general, or God, are idealizations because they are infinite as existence, which are for themselves. However, they are not ideationally different from that which is for one. For if they were different, they would be only immediate, or more precisely, they would only be existence and a being for another. For if the moment of being for one did not attach to them, it is not they themselves, but an other that would be that which is for them. So, you know, the being for itself uh, is fully only for itself. You know, what is for it is itself fuck oh now now the <laughs> damn. so Nothing now the, the example of the self-conscious now makes like a hell of a lot more sense uh, i mean it made sense already and like now it just kind of hit me again 
in which you know self-conscious is for itself why guess what the object of self-conscious is itself yeah. <laughs> therefore it is seriously and fully being for one or being for itself but self-consciousness requires another i thought being for itself didn't no but so self-consciousness has no other it is itself you know the object of consciousness is itself yeah but consciousness is yeah but you're thinking about the has. you're thinking about the the existence being for itself is the whole thing okay In the relationship of individuals, self-consciousness is not within me. It is between us. It is that process of consciousness against consciousness. Therefore, consciousness is the object of itself. It is self-conscious. It is for itself. And it is for one. That one being, the one being that actual whole process of relationship. Rather than like the individuals themselves. So God is therefore for himself insofar as he is himself that which is for him. Being for itself and being for one are not therefore diverse significations of ideality but essential, inseparable moments of it. And I'll be honest, I still don't know what that last sentence is but uh, I think we'll find out uh, with the remarks and uh, as the chapter goes on. But we've been going on for I think An hour and a half, so I think that's good enough to leave it there at the start of the remark. But yeah, it's exactly what I expected uh, Hegel kicking my ass in ways that... Uh, this reminds me like when we first read it. Like really, it's finally like stuff that's really, really new. And I'm... I'm definitely having trouble uh, thinking it. Uh, I definitely have to work through it. So uh, we'll we'll keep this up, and uh, I'll try to get that stupid uh, chapter two outline done. Like it's just it feels outdated at the same time. Like I'm just li really being lazy. But I really need to finish it because there's things there that uh, I think uh, I definitely need to fully settle before uh, I I grasp what goes on in chapter three completely. But all right. Uh, if you uh, listen to this, uh, hope you enjoy it. Uh, hope it would have helped you somewhat. Uh, next time, I'll, we'll definitely backtrack a bit and like uh, recover this stuff with whatever it is that uh, we learn uh, thinking over it over the week. So yeah, uh, see you next time.